I love that video. My favorite part of that video, there's a little like asterisk next to one of the, the lines that comes across, and it's about an auto washing feature. And then if you, I paused, and if you look down at the bottom, it says, only if you put in the dishwasher. I thought that was a real nice microcosm of just American culture and advertising as a whole. But you see, as Americans, we, well, we love upgrades. You know the drill, right? You buy a perfectly good something to replace the perfectly good something that you already had because it's the newest or it's the sexiest or it has a new color or something along those lines, right? We do this with phones. We do this with cars. We do this with houses. We do this with jewelry. You fill in the blank with whatever actually applies to you. Now, this week in American culture, it's a, it's a, it's a pivot point. It, it happens every single year in the same week, every single year. And it's, it's where we pivot from being thankful for, for one day, to I want more for an entire month. As my boy Andy Stanley would say, we go from being grateful to being cartful. Right? Like, you fill up your cart online, and then I don't know about you, but I, like, fill it up, and then I'm like, no, that's too expensive. No, but I really want it. I'll leave it in the cart for later until I can afford it. Like, I, I just, like, plan ahead with my cart. Thank you, Amazon. But what Amazon always reminds me of is that, like, you know, I'm, I'm not wearing the right clothes, or I'm not, you know, I don't have the right glasses, which I don't have my glasses on today, but they weren't the right ones, so I didn't wear them, right? Or you don't have a big enough TV, or you're not baking the right cookies, or you don't have the right decor in your house, or it's not painted the right color, or that you, you know, that you need a barn to hold your pottery. But whatever, whatever the case may be, culture always reminds us of what we don't have, and what we do have, we need to let me, let me upgrade you. And what happens is we become dissatisfied with what we have, and then we become dissatisfied with what we can't afford, all while forgetting that we have food, we have shelter, we have transportation, we have all the things that we actually need. But this season quickly becomes a season that just reminds us that we have to, well, upgrade. Now, I'm old enough to remember this may date me a little bit, and, and some of you may, but most of you may not. I'm old enough to remember a time, this is going to be crazy for you, that when, when something broke, you fixed it. <laughs> I know. Isn't that crazy? Like, my favorite part about breaking stuff is buying the new stuff that goes with it, right? I'm like, oh, that's a bummer. I broke that golf club. <laughs> Now I get a new one or a whole new set, right? But the reason why we become so dissatisfied with our stuff and try to upgrade our stuff so often is not, not because our stuff is bad, but because we become aware of what's out there, right? And, and, and how do we become aware? Well, advertising companies, they spend trillions of dollars every single year, trillions with a T, letting you know what's out there. It's, it's why when you buy something, I don't know if this happens to you, it happens to me all the time. Like when you buy something, you get posed with a question, like as you're like checking out, like, you know, you also might like this. Or some of the items that you have, have looked at, they, they, actually, they actually relate to these items over here. Or then they, then they peer pressure you. They're like, you know, customers who bought what you're about to buy, they also bought this and so you should do that and then this is my favorite one they say these items were frequently bought together like you're gonna buy the new driver because last year's driver didn't drive straight because it had nothing to do with your terrible golf game and everything to do with the driver and so you bought the new one and they oh let's round out the whole golf set with a new putter that is you know gonna put balls in the hole perfectly every single time so the question is it begs the question that's my question for you. How do you stay satisfied? How do you stay thankful in a world that runs on dissatisfaction? Right? And, and if, if getting more stuff doesn't make it go away, right? You know that because our, our desire for stuff is just like any other appetite. If you feed it, it will grow. Like, you're not, you're not pushing away from the Thanksgiving meal going, well, I don't have to eat ever again. No, what are you going to do? Like, like three hours later or maybe three minutes later, you're going to come back for round 12 because what you did is you expanded your stomach out and now your appetite has grown, right? And the real issue is, the real issue is, is that it, there's no problem with providing for your family or, 
you know, having nice things if you can afford them. Or, you know, there's, no, there's nothing sinister about good marketing. But the problem is, it becomes a problem when you have too much credit card debt. It becomes a little unsettling when you have no savings account, but yet you have things in your garage that are collecting dust. It becomes a little bit of an issue when you have no financial peace. Because here's the deal, and you know this because you're smart. Like, it doesn't matter how much money you make. If you don't have any, like, protection built into your finances, there's no financial peace there. And so, again, there's no, there's no problem with uh, good marketing. There's no problem with, uh, you know, providing for your family and having nice things and all the things. But there is a problem when the focus begins and ends on upgrading. Now, it's not all bad news. Listen, not all dissatisfaction is bad. There is good dissatisfaction, right? Like, say, say your career is not going the way that you want it to or that you picture. And so you decide, hey, like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upgrade a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get a master's degree. Or maybe I'm just going to go to college for the very first time. Or, or I'm going to go into something vocational. Or maybe I'm going to join the military. These, these are good things. They find you financial peace. They help you provide for your family. This is a good thing. Maybe even a God thing. Those are good things upgrades. Because, see, some of the dissatisfaction that we have has led to the most powerful things on this earth. Like, people were rightfully dissatisfied with feeling pain during surgery, so guess what they did? They came up with anesthesia, okay? Like, people, people were dissatisfied with the fact that half of the, the people on the earth don't have clean water, and so they're taking these innovative ways and driving water into the f farthest reaches of the world, clean water for people to have, and we're working on things like poverty and working on things like slavery and working on things like hungry because people were dissatisfied with what was going on, and they decided to make a difference. Now, here's the catch, though. Those people who, who let dissatisfaction drive them into doing great things, to drive them into making change, to drive them into investing in something, those people aren't controlled by the same dissatisfaction that controls people like me and people like you that are controlled by this stuff. Because those people, they get out and they see dissatisfaction and they decide to make a change, whereas you and I, well, we just decide to upgrade. Now, there's a driving force behind this. It's not all your fault. It's not all my fault. Because nowadays, there never has been so much want, even though we have so much more than anybody in the history of the world has ever had. And the driving force behind a lot of that, this isn't just me, I didn't come up with this, this is social media as a whole, has driven our lives to want more. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to social media, what, what we end up doing is we, we look at this perfect vision of somebody because people, are putting, people aren't putting unfiltered pictures of themselves, they're putting all the pretty filters and all the things online, and they're putting their best foot forward. And what they're actually doing, and what actually happens to us, is we are comparing our lowest of the lows with people's highest of the highs. In other words, we, we, feel like, we feel like losers because, well, we, we see their best of the best, but we know our worst of the worst, and it compels us to buy houses we can't afford and to buy cars we shouldn't and to do things we shouldn't do and to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. You see, never before in history have, have we been so accurately able to measure popularity. So I don't know about you guys, but when I was young, like, you just kind of sort of like guessed who was popular until you got to high school. And then you're like, oh, they're clearly popular. I'm clearly not. Like, like I, remember, I remember my friend Pete back in high school. He lived like across the street and two doors down. I can picture it like it was yesterday. Pete, in the summer of 87 or 88, got a Nintendo, like an OG Nintendo. This is actually my Nintendo from my childhood. No, you can't touch it. Yes, I still play it. And it's awesome. But Pete got one years before I ever did because, well, Pete was awesome, and Pete was popular for the entire summer. Nowadays, what happens? Well, we have analytics to our popularity. I have 379 followers on Instagram. True story. She might have 492. So that is, carry the one, she is 23% more popular than I am. Like, like, I post a picture, and I get, like, 19 likes, and she posts a picture, and she gets 119 likes, and it's not fair, but we, what we end up doing, and what you end up doing is you end up comparing, you end up summarizing that everybody else is better, and that my life, well, 
sort of sucks. And so for the rest of our time here with you, I want you to do one very important thing. I just want you to be very, 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 like, like just super honest about exposing any dissatisfaction you have that is driving you to upgrade. And so I want to spend, a, I, want, I want to give you a few areas, if you will, the areas that someone, someone exposed in my life years ago. And so it's something, these are things that I struggle with. And so maybe, just maybe, they're things that you might struggle with. And so I want you to be just gut level honest with yourself. You don't have to do all the little activities and class participation we're about to do, but I want you to think just deeply and honestly about what's going on in your heart when it comes to these things. And the first one is this. It is material and financial dissatisfaction. This is a tangible one. Like, you hate them because they have the car, and so you hate the car, and you hate them because they function in a different tax bracket than you do, right? Like, you're, you're just trying to, like, make it to tax season so you can get a refund back on all your taxes. Meanwhile, they're paying taxes, right? And you're just hoping to make it to the end of the month, right? And so their best of the best is so much better than your worst of the worst, and so it's palpable, and it causes dissatisfaction. Now, if that has been a problem for you ever, not just now, raise your hand. Okay, okay. There's a couple of people with material and financial dissatisfaction. That's a big one for me. The next one is this. That's the first one. The second one is this. Relational dissatisfaction. This is, this is the FOMO. This is the fear of missing out, right? All your friends are out with all your other friends, and you're wondering why you're not out with all your friends who are out with your friends, right? And like, or maybe, maybe you're single, and all your friends are married, and it, like you look at their married life, and it's all like cupcakes and unicorns and rainbows and beautiful. And like you're just over here going, I'm tired of being the third wheel. I'm tired of being the fifth wheel. I'm tired of being the seventh or the ninth wheel, right? Like it's relational. You see the relational intimacy that these couples have in their marriages, and it's beautiful. And you're just over here living the single dream, question mark, maybe nightmare. So if that's been a problem for you, relational. This is a big one for me, FOMO. Let me see your hands. Okay, not as many as the first one. That's all right. We got a third one. I think this one will, this one, this one will I think it will bring it home. Circumstantial dissatisfaction, right? You look at somebody else's life and you compare it to your life, and you're like, I want to be them. I want to do that, right? And, and and it can go a little bit deeper than that because you're at a point in your life now where you're like, man, I I, I thought I would be doing more. I thought I would be doing something special. I, I thought I would have, have a purpose that was greater than me, and, and I don't anymore. And you know what? Maybe it's super specific. Like you're watching like the 14th like gender reveal party on Instagram, and you're over here struggling with infertility. And there's bitterness in your heart, and it starts to hurt, and you start to get angry, and you don't even know why, and your circumstances all of a sudden make you feel inadequate, and your circumstances all of a sudden make you feel lacking. This is a hard one for me. It's really hard because I work at a church. Let me explain. Myself, just like all the other staff members at just about every other church, well, we work on the weekends. And you're out at the game. You're doing your thing, cooking out, whatever, on a Saturday night. Meanwhile, I'm at home, you know, serving the Lord. And you're out there serving the devil and all the devil's things and earthly things. And I'm just praying real hard for you. I'm not bitter at all, right? It's circumstantial. I heard a pastor once say, and you've heard this before. This is, this, this is a common thing. But I, I heard a pastor once say that 10% of our lives is what happens to you. And 90% is how you respond to it, right? Who, 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 that's pretty solid. That's good stuff, right? Yeah, that's not reality, though. That's not how you and I see it. The, how we see it is actually completely opposite. 90% is what happens to us, and 10%, how we react, oh, we have just this little amount of control because we don't have any say in our circumstances. And to me, it's all about perspective. And I've said this before that like you have to you have to replace dissatisfaction. Like you can't just go ahead and decide, hey, I don't want to be dissatisfied anymore. No, you have to replace it with something else, or maybe someone else will get there. So how do you, how do you do that? How do you, what, what does that even look like? Well, it starts with replacing your perspective. And for obvious reasons, based on who I am and where I work, I think that you should replace your worldly perspective with a Christ-like perspective. Now, you, you, you might not be Christian, and you may hate Jesus, but stick with me on this. Stay with me on this. And, and I, I ask a favor of you. 
allow God, just allow, like, just for a second, okay? You're not, you're not becoming a Christian right now, but just for a second, allow God to speak intentionally and, and honestly into your life. Because what I want to do is I want to give you a real-life example from a situation that is most likely far worse than anything that you and I are going through. Because what I want to talk about with you is a guy by the name of Paul. Now, Paul, if you don't know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. He, uh, he's the reason probably why I get to stand here today. He, he kind of shaped a lot of what we view as Christianity. And Paul had this incredible way of just responding towards his circumstances in the most positive way. Well, how'd he do it? Well, he consistently and constantly responded in a Christ-like way in a Christ-like perspective. In fact, what I want to do is I want to I look at one of, the most, one of the most famous things that Paul ever said, but it's a perfect verse on perspective and this concept of dissatisfaction and not being grateful and thankful in everything that we do. And in order to really get the full effect about what this looks like, you got to understand the context of where Paul is writing. And again, Paul did a lot of writing, and he did a lot of writing from a Roman prison, which is where he is in our little story. But Paul's not just in a Roman prison. What he's doing is he's writing in a Roman prison where he is chained to a guard 24-7 while he poops, eats, and sleeps. So chances are his circumstances are just a little bit worse than yours. And this is what Paul says. Check this out. He says, I know what it is to be in need. I bet you do in prison. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. In any and every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in one. He says, hey, you want to know a secret? You want to know how to be content in everything? And I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, Paul, that sounds awesome. He says, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. See, that's Philippians 4.13. That's the one. That's the one that everybody loves. That's the one that gets all the credit. But 12 really sets up 13 to knock it out of the park, right? Like he says, he says you want to be content? Christ. You want joy in the simple things? You want joy in the terrible things? You want joy across the board? Christ. You want satisfaction in every single thing that you do? Christ. It's not found in what you have. It's not found in what you don't have. Paul, chained to a Roman guard, says, you know what the secret is? The secret is Christ and Christ alone. And you're thinking to yourself, well, well, Ryan, I'm I'm content all the time. I was content when I bought that Audi. I, I bet you were content when you bought that car. But you know what? How long? A week? A month? Like, like it's still just four wheels, gets you from point A to point B, goes on premium gas, and it's too expensive to repair. Like, it's still just a car. But here's the thing. Listen, listen, listen. If you get to nothing else, listen to this. Until Christ is all you have, until Christ is all you have, you'll never recognize that Christ is all that you need. It's true. Paul says, you, you want to know a secret? You want a secret to being content? Strip everything away. Strip every, get rid of everything, and you'll still be content because you have the Savior. You'll still be content because you have the Son of God. You'll still, if, if you would just recognize His presence and His peace, that His presence and His peace are real and tangible, it, it past anything that our humanity can understand. If you can just recognize that, His satisfaction will surpass anything that this earthly world will have, because He will be your satisfaction. He will be your blessed assurance. He will be your sustainer. He will be your redeemer. He will be your rock. But until the goodness, until you experience the goodness of Christ. You're always going to be dissatisfied. You're never going to be grateful with what this world has because the world is not enough. And how do I know? How do I know? What, what I'm about to say, you, you don't even have to be a Christian for this to make sense, right? Let me, it just so happens that it comes out of the Christian Bible, which does make sense for where you're watching and who you're watching. But check this out. For the world only offer, offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and our possessions. Again, you could be an atheist, and that makes sense to you. It's a worldly thing. They're not from the Father. If you're an atheist, you definitely think that's true. But are from where? From this world. Again, we can all agree, Christian, non-Christian, you can agree that they're of this world. But here comes the logic in this. Here comes the apologetics in this. Here comes, here comes the breakdown, really. If the world isn't going to last, then it has no capacity to give me a lasting answer to my longings. If the world's not going to last, it can't give you lasting satisfaction. 
If you're looking to the world for satisfaction, you're going to miss out. It's not going to solve your problems. Again, you don't even have to be a Christian to believe that. It doesn't make any sense. But here's the Christian thing. Inside of you, inside of me, every single one of us, there is a Christ-shaped void. You want to upgrade your life? You want the ultimate upgrade? Upgrade your faith. You want to upgrade your life, upgrade your relationship with your heavenly father because you were born for more. You were born for eternity. There is a longing inside of you for something more. And the stuff of this world, the things of this world aren't going to cut it. You know better until you let, and let is the key word here, Christ be all you need. You'll never win the battle of dissatisfaction. You won't. Paul says, you want to know a secret? I could have a lot. I could have a little. But it's by Christ that I can do everything that he has called me to do. See, we misquote that verse all the time. Like, I wore it once on a marathon shirt as I was running, and I'm like, Christ is, you know, going to give me strength. And, and that, that makes sense. But you know what? It says, all of what Christ has called me to do. Because if Christ doesn't put it out in front of you, then you're doing it in your own strength. And my friend, it's not going to end well. So how does, this, how does this work out in your life? What, is this, what does this look like? Well, I want to give you two suggestions. Two suggestions. They were suggested to me a very long time ago. They have stayed with me in every single thing that I do. They were suggested to me by a pastor friend. But again, none of this is going to surprise you. You know all this, again, because you're smart people. But these, these two things have affected me in a positive way that, well, frankly, not many other things have. Now, here's the thing about the two things. One is very easy to do, and one is very hard to do. But they're both important. And so the first one is this. Take a break. Take a break. Not like go on vacation, because those can be stressful. No, take a break. Like if, if it's feeding into envy, Take a break. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe, maybe it's a habit that you have. Maybe, maybe, maybe just maybe it's like me. It's social media. Get off social media. I, I get off social media from time to time all the time. Like, like maybe, maybe a week, maybe a day, maybe, maybe an hour, maybe a month, maybe a year. One time I got off social media for a year. Do you know why? I got on Facebook, and I, I looked at all the posts, and there were 50 straight negative posts that were advertising something or someone that in advertising that instead of Christ. And I said, I said to myself, at 50, I'm going to shut it down. I got to 50, and I'm like, oh, I guess I got to shut it down. And I shut it down, and I came back a year later, and guess what? Facebook was still there. Imagine that. But it was causing me issues, and so I shut it down. That's the easy one. That's the easy one, because you can, you can hit unsubscribe. You can, you can hide a relationship or something like that. You can hide a company out of your feed because what you're doing is you're actually eliminating their influence on you. You're eliminating the addiction to the instant gratification. Again, that's the easy one. The second one, if we're being completely honest, takes strength beyond you. We like to think that we do this, but we don't. Not without being intentional about it. Not without working towards it. The second one is this, celebrating and being grateful for the success, success, this, this, you get it, it's on the screen, of others. You're like, I do that all the time. I totally celebrate other people, not when they get a blessing that you wanted. When I learned to celebrate other people, when I was missing out, whew, what a game changer. Because what it does is it purifies the intentions of my heart. Right? Like, like they got the job that you wanted. You have, two, you have two choices. You have two perspectives. You can either say, what the heck, God? I wanted that job. I deserved that job. I should have had that job. Or you can say, God must have, God's in control. So he must have had a really good reason for why they got the job. And so you know what, God? I'm going to thank you for the blessing in their life. Right? I'm going to thank you for the blessing. It happens all the time when you see that they have more money than you or they have the toy that you want or they have the house that you want. Man, God, I'm going to thank you for the blessing, for your hand of blessing over their life. Because you know what? You can't honestly pray for someone who you are bitter and jealous of. It will purify your heart. 
And there is only one person, only one thing in this world that can lead you to do that honestly, and it's Christ. That's the secret. That's the replacement. You take out the bitterness, you take out the envy, you take out the jealousy, you take out the judgment, and you put in Christ. And through his power, not through your power, through his power, and you have to surrender that over to him. Otherwise, you're going to miss out. It's through that power that you kill the judgment. It's through that power that you kill the envy. It's through that power that you kill the resentment. And you know why you should do that? Because James, the brother of Jesus, you know what he says, you know what he says about these things? When it comes to envy and bitterness, he says they're earthly. He gets real up in your feels. He says they're unchristian. And then, then he takes it one step further. You're not ready for this. He calls them demonic. And I don't know know about you, and I don't know where you stand, but I don't want to really support anything that's demonic. But it's through Christ that you can defeat those things by letting Christ replace your earthly desires. And when you do, you will experience life the way God desires you to. You will experience life the way your creator, the way your maker, the way your father who loves you, who created you for his purpose and his glory. Then you'll then you'll get to experience life that way. The abundant life. And so here's my challenge for you. I'm going to wrap up. Challenge for the, the whole Christmas season, if you will, as we push into that. It's to find the things in your life that are causing you dissatisfaction. Not like your kids or anything like that. Like, find the things in your life that are causing you to be envious of other people. That, that you have replaced with Christ, where you feel like, if I just don't upgrade this one thing, I'm just not going to make it. Find that one thing in your life and eliminate it. That's it. That's it. I know it should be, you know, this big grand thing. No, 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 no. You don't need that. You just need to apply what you've already learned. You just need to apply what you've already heard. You don't you don't need any more sermons from a talking head to go out and make an actual palpable distance difference in your life. You just need Christ. That's the secret. That's the secret to being content in every single thing. Let's pray. God, I thank you for, well, just giving us Christ because without him, one, we would spend eternity without you, but two, we would be so lost. So God, as we move into this new season, the season that always gets so crazy where we're supposed to be celebrating your son's birth, instead we celebrate the new upgraded thing. And so God, I thank you for sending your son, and I just ask that I especially in my life, God, that you would just remind us, remind me to keep the main thing the main thing, to replace the bitterness and to replace the envy and to replace the need to upgrade and to replace it with your son so that I and the people under the sound of my voice can experience you in a new and fresh way and experience this world the way you designed us to. We love you, we thank you, and we thank you most of all for sending your son. And it's in his precious name we pray, amen. Have a great week, have a great last Sunday, and we will see you right back here for the first Sunday of the month when we celebrate baptism. See you then.